Thank you for tuning in to Androna Talks Radio. Gathering as one in our sovereign truth from a galactic perspective. Exploring our world with new ideas, knowledge and a promise of a better future. Galactic discussions for collective-minded people. And Drona Talks. Hello, everyone. I decided to bring a Andronic Talks extra because I couldn't help but think of uh, many things that Jennifer was speaking about in the fifth regression that we did. In fact, I believe this was the first regression we did, but you know, clearly it was obvious for many reasons that the information was really packed with um, some startling information and um, was reluctant to present it for obvious obvious reasons but um, on the other hand uh, the the part that I'm going to focus on here is the part where she talks about Poseidon now in October 22nd 2015 when I was on Wolf Spirit Radio and I did some of the earlier transmissions this is transmission number 20 of the Andronicus transmissions with JP. And um, well, JP, you know, was really brilliant at it, you know, and I, I honestly I appreciated JP at the time, and I appreciate Ian. Um, they do a wonderful job. And, you know, if you, I'm going to insert the portion where we talk about Kit Triton, who, was, who evolves into becoming Poseidon later in time, but was originally called Ketriton, and he was a titan. And so he, um, you know, we're just hearing from the perspective of Andronicus, who is an Andromedan, and he's giving us the history from the history of, of uh, the Andromedans and, and his people and what that they had experienced. And as we're going through this whole thing, I mean, it's, it becomes very... Um, startling because you know you see this whole thing where Poseidon or a Ketriton comes in sees these very gentle type of people and then he takes over he just takes over what's interesting is JP you know mentions well maybe uh, you know he questions what the intention of Ketriton was because I mean he literally starts an army he does all sorts of different things and uh, I want to just bring to everyone's attention that Jennifer, I didn't know Jennifer for very long uh, when we first did the regression. And she had clearly had not listened to all of the Andronicus transmissions. She was listening to my more recent shows. And so she didn't have a knowledge of any of this. And so after we did the regression, I said, you know, this is, the, I asked her during the regression, I said, is this on Neptune? And she said, no, it's here. So when I went back and listened to what JP had to say, he, he calls this a parallel universe. And I thought, now that's interesting. Um, and a lot of other things that he said were very insightful. Um, and it definitely lends to this story where Jennifer doesn't know about it. Now she's giving it a perspective of what it was like to actually be that king who had lost everything, who was overthrown, who had a daughter that was taken, who had a wife that was pretty much, you know, shut down and blinded and couldn't see what was going on. Some of the other things that JP talks about, or we discuss during this about the plants having heads and faces, and uh, it's kind of startling. They, they start off on this journey as as travelers. Um, Andronicus comes from one, one planet, and they have these outposts. And as they're traveling on the outpost, they end up bringing along the titans with them. 
and um, you know there's there's all sorts of things that go on. So if you listen to the prior, if you listen to the prior transmissions, you'll see the history of what happens and how he gets to know the Titans. And then as he um, moves forward in time, they're headed for Sitar, which um, is, I believe, his word for Saturn. Um, he also talks about Sumer, which was would have been me, um, and the whole thing with Semiramis, which was um, how earlier uh, the stories in the transmission explain how that evolved as well. And so you see this whole thing about how King Triton or King uh, Ketriton takes over this this group of Neptunians who, in my opinion, were parallel to the Atlanteans in the stories of Atlantis. The um, last... Uh, so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share about 10 minutes of the show and then you can listen to it. But I also want to bring up that uh, I wrote a book called The Seer, Violets in the Grass, which I'll also provide a link. And in it was written in 2012, and uh, I have, it, it is called um, the chapter that I was referring to where I talk about Atlantis and what happened is Atlantis rising with the sun. And it's the second to last chapter in the book. And I tell a story about um, some of my memories regarding what happened there. And, of course, there's other stories, too, that I was I was starting to channel a lot of this information around 2012. And so then, um, of course, this interview with JP was 2015, and, and here we are, 2019, still looking at this story, because obviously it is not resolved. And obviously people... Uh, didn't have an understanding of what was actually transpiring there. And is this all interconnected with a lot of our problems? It could very well be so because I was told in, in back in 2012 that when Atlantis starts rising with the sun or when Atlantis starts coming back up, that that's when we're going to have more of a realization because it's almost like they bring up these truths. Now, Jennifer remembering that she was the first king brought in a lot of information and there are others that were also a part of this kingdom that have information regarding what might have happened and so we get an another perspective the more perspectives we have the more information that we'll gather or gain from this um in the story that jennifer tell talks about i was her daughter i had reddish hair um, here it is, talking about me being a redhead uh, with uh, in the Andronicus transmissions. Uh, we talk about Gupta, who was uh, from Vega, and he is a guide and, and someone who helps Andronicus because Andronicus chose to not remember everything. So he has assistance from Vega, and he talks about Shiva as well. Um, the plants have faces and heads, which is kind of a funny thing. People thought it was silly. But we actually have plants on the, our planet today on Earth and that have some faces and look like animals and look like different things. So I have a link to that as well for people to take a look at. Um, interesting, he refers to the Neptunian people as the Nephrids. And of course, there's more information. I'm just going to give you about 10 minutes of um, the transmission and then, of course, if you want to hear more of the instructions, we'll provide the link of that show. So thank you for listening, and uh, here goes. Greetings, my friend. We are still on our journey across the galaxy with planet Satar solemnly awaiting us. Regarding our crops, we have new plants from some of the seeds we gathered during our stopover at the base planet before we landed on Neptune. We stayed in Neptune for a few months, your time. We know that this station has all the supplies that we needed and more. The beings there at the outpost are quite harmonious. We call them Nephrids, and they are quite lovely and gentle, 
as our untainted selves once were. We didn't stay very long, but we enjoyed the hospitable interaction at the outpost. They are simple, but lovely. They are, they are the same on Neptune. Ketraiton wanted to stay as well as Katron. They always seemed to find a form of solace there, or they seemed to find a, a form of solace there as we did. Maybe it was that it resembled their planet's aquatic atmosphere. They even removed their black stones and abort aborted some other missions to attend. To my surprise, the rest of their crew followed their lead. They all left their black stones behind for me to dispose of them. Gupta reminded me that love, peace and gentleness can assist the war-weary to find a more appealing place of rest. I agree. I was quite tempted to stay as well. The female Nephrids here are quite lovely, and I was so satisfied to see that we could find our own refuge here now and possibly in the future. It takes... It takes long to recognize... Uh, uh, it didn't take long to recognize that this place was a paradise filled with beautiful oceanic creatures, plants, and a colorful, colorful array of sea life. My goal was to gather more plants. I took many seeds and some of them sprouted right away. Some of them seemed to have faces and heads like humans. I had trouble eating them and asked them asked what they wanted me to do with them. They seemed to be for here for us, but I just couldn't eat them. How disturbing was this? I then consulted Gupta again. Uh, Gupta is a Vega, a Vega. He's tall and blue. And he told me that they are the most primitive of plant life. They were almost evolving into another form, so the Vegas altered the fabric of their DNA to display a less intelligent plant life so they could be consumed without damaging the conscious mind. Gupta said, No worries about it. Allow the creature to return to Neptune. We will we'll help you find other seeds for you to grow and consume. As soon as Gupta said that, the Neptunians brought other underwater plants to us. It is something you call seaweed. We discovered that their texture was a bit slimy and taste was pungent, but we learned to dry and cultivate it so it had a more refined flavor. Oh my god, they invented sushi. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Two of the women brought me some other treats from the sea and I was quite enamored by these females. Our women had been separated from us for some time now, and I do miss the connection we had. Neither Neptunian nor Nephrid female wanted to venture off to Satar with us. They said it was too rough and harsh for their idea of living. I understood what they were saying. They lived very sheltered and protected here. The idea of strong Ketritons here will enhance their security and sustainability. Ketritons began, Ketriton began setting up his makeshift kingdom, and Ketron started to rec started began to start recruiting soldiers of the mer beings <laughs> typical <laughs> typical bloody typical <laughs> a woman caught my eye when i was amongst the group on our last day she seemed different from the rest and almost appeared to be hiding i knew she was lovely from a distance her hair was long locks of wavy reddish brown curls her skin was the color of sand I couldn't understand why she didn't come closer. I began to see that she may have been a captive, but just as I was studying her, I was distracted by the others who came with music and food and dances. When I look back to catch her eye with hope of getting her to come closer, she seems to have disappeared. The music got louder, and I reached over to an elder to inquire about her. They said that there are a few captives on the planet. As a, visitor, as a visitor, it was impolite to ask for her when there were so many native females who would be insulted. I said that wasn't the reason I was asking, and the music kept getting louder as the gentlemen were then pulled away from me. I suddenly realized that they were hoping I would take one of the Nephrid women as a wife, just as Catriton and Catron did. As soon as I realized this, I had to re refrain and return to the ship. I thought, hmm, this is not my destiny. This ended my visit there. After that, I wasn't able to get a straight answer about anything. Apparently, they were all offended. Between Katran and Katriton and their men, they all took their share of women who they wanted. The female I inquired about went with Katriton. From what I was told later, 
He chose her first, not knowing I was interested. There was something about her that seemed familiar. Maybe in time it will make sense. They all called Triton King Triton. He treats them all as his wife, daughters, and sons. I'm back in the ship again, traveling and feeling very angry. I just received a confirmation that the woman with reddish hair was Sumaramis. She is now the wife or daughter of Catriton. She didn't remember me. That is the reason why she stayed away. Apparently, she had died from her lifetime as Ishtar and is now living as a slave in Neptune. In just a short period of time, she became a princess. I know Catriton remembered her. He must have. I heard he loves her very much as well as the others. That could have been me. <laughs> so much for valiance and being a devotee to helping the planets. I feel betrayed and distraught. My friend took my wife. The Vegas said it would be hard for me. I don't want to go on any more. My crew is finally back with me, all awakened and trying to console me. I wish I had let them stay up to help me on this venture. Sarius warned me that the Catritons were trouble, and that we would be punished for what had happened on Zephron. The strange plants were his interpretation of abusing the planet in our offense to the Arcturians. I couldn't help but agree. My heart was very heavy, and my emotions began to run deeper. There was nothing more that I could do. <sighs> My crew suggested I return to Neptune and take Suma with me. I thought long and hard over that and consulted Gupta. He advised me that this was part of Suma Amis's journey of the soul. She needed to understand what it was like to be in power as well as what it was like to be a slave. He also said the destiny of that civilization would not last due to other circumstances around it. They have no purpose, they lived only for pleasure. For that reason, they didn't last long. All living beings must have a purpose, or they will be limited. Huh, another interesting galactic law there. In essence, he was saying that I should leave her alone. When she is finished with this life, she will move into another. If I interfere, she will not move on properly into her growth of evolution. She didn't understand me while I was with her. Yeah, she didn't understand me while I was with her. He said, if you're patient, you will get to be together in time. To this I learned to agree, although the jealousy and anger did not subside. I took it with me onto Satar, as well as the black stones of the Catritons. Where to go from here? I don't have the lines. It's, it, it, can you not see it in, in the thing? No, I can't oh. see it. All right, I, I posted it in the uh, chat. Uh, oh, you're on the tablet. I don't know if you can see the chat box. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so, question. I'm sorry to hear about your pain. Stories like that happen often on Earth. There seems to be a lot of separation between couples here. It is painful. In your case, she just didn't remember you. It appears that you do remember Jessica, I am trying to remember how it all began. As you are speaking, it is all coming back to me. I can almost relive it all. The story unfolds in my head like a lost memory of the past rekindled by a hymn, a vista, or a word. Andronicus replies, We all need to remember where we came from so that we can then move forward to where we are going and why. None of these situations are easy to acknowledge. There is much pain in it, as well as equal measures of joy, and time heals all of it. I think it is the lessons of life, the imperfections of decisions and judgment. In my case, it is the pain of immortality, the pain of remembering it all while others, while others forget. There is a private sense of isolation, a ripple of death in every hello, the expectation that can never be met. It is falling in love with someone different who is not of your kind. The expectations are never met, yet we stumble over this time and time again. 
You humans are temporal in the flesh but have souls that are eternal. Your memories have depths of lifetimes before and yet you make the same mistakes, connect with the same people who originally called you pain and then do it again. It is like a gravitational pull to what, towards what destroys you. I don't understand any of it. I question all of it and then I surrender. Lord Shiva keeps silent in his wave of outstretched ha arms to many. I suppose I still have much to learn as well. I am grateful that Gupta has befriended me. He has been my sanity in all of this. I will put my heart aside from love and search with a greater heart towards others. Farewell for now, my friends. 86-96-44-3 we have left all the black stones at the bottom of the sea because we didn't want them on the ship with us. We lift and travel lighter now and on to Satar. Andronicus. Okay. So, very, very, wow, very poignant. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really sorry for this poor guy. I know, I know, it's very sad. It was like, like some kind of interference, you know, that keeps happening and uh and that now it's coupled with um uh probably feelings of betrayal even though there's no awareness by um sumer and ketron maybe he recognized her maybe not but didn't do it unintentionally because by the time they landed on the planet they were on good talking terms so Unless he's like just really, really sadistic and mean, and and you know knew it and thought, ah, oh, I'll have her. Yeah, I, I, I didn't really, lesson. I didn't really get that because there were so many females there that it really was okay. And and if Andronicus wanted her, he could have had her. In addition to one of the other women, I think that they wanted him to choose another woman first of the Nephrids, and those are what, what they were calling the Neptune people. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the reason why I couldn't read my lines and questions that I had, um, I gave the file, fortunately, to uh, JP yesterday, <laughs> and uh, then my computer went down. So we had some uh, challenges. Um, there was always some technology today, so uh, hopefully you understand. But, yeah, the, it was a very, very um, touching, very moving experience, and here again is uh, the loss of innocence that seemed to occur when he felt betrayed not only by his you know the whole comment of my best friend is now with the the one that I love and uh, and then feeling you know that that whole betrayal on both parts or that Sumer didn't approach him and and so there was just a lot going on there and, and not to mention too that you know there's the issues of food here's a kingdom that that just Begins and, and Triton now takes on Neptune, which is the origin of when he arrives there and, and begins to rule, but technically he was a Titan. So, so Triton the Titan becomes King Triton of Neptune, mm -hmm. um, and then there's, so there's, it's, it's strange, it's cause like we've got our mythology and we've got the King Neptune who has a trident. Mm -hmm. And now, we, now we've got Triton, who's the king of Neptune. <laughs> it's like yeah. it's like a slightly parallel universe of, of names and things. Yeah, but I'm sure sense. things. I'm sure things will will kind of flip over in time because, like, a lot of these names, like we had Primus Teus, you know, who mm -hmm. became Prometheus, and then we had um, Sumeramis, who became Semiramis. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just the, like the letters are, are kind of kind of settling into place, as it were, aren't they? Right, there's an names. evolution. Mm -hmm. It's it's very interesting. Yeah, and, and when I saw how how uh, Triton, you know, was readily received by everyone, and he just said, "This place is mine." <laughs> he just he just took it. I mean, he, he just moved in, eh? Yeah. Well, it you know what it felt like when I started picking up the energy from there. It was just this pleasurable paradise. There really wasn't any warfare. There wasn't any politics. It was, there weren't any real agendas. 
it was just people sitting around and it was all related to pleasure. Oh, just a, a nice, happy place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, you know, in, in, um, in astrology, Neptune represents, uh, the idealist dream. Mm, okay. So perhaps, you know, that's how it manifests there. That, you know, you want to manifest pleasure? There you go. There's Neptune. There's probably places you could manifest hell as well. And presumably, uh, what does the effect of the black stones at the bottom of the sea in Neptune <laughs> do to the planet? That's what right. I'm interested in. It's like, oh, we just dumped them there. All right, good idea. <laughs> well, if you're listening to the reading of the seer violets in the grass, the outcome of that is in there. <laughs> And uh, there's one point where um, I had a vision and memory of, um, should I say it or should we yeah, no, no, let it's, the it's transmission? Right. It, no, it's, it's good. It's good. Okay. It's good to not say it? <laughs> no, it's good to say it. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, my memory of it, and this is before I was even connecting with Andronicus, uh, saw I was in what appeared to be Neptune and Triton was there and Triton seemed like he was my father or, you know, a fatherly overlord in the space. And uh, suddenly we looked up and these black um, skates uh, or um, rays, stingrays kind of creature rises up above the water and then they take over. They, they shroud the entire um, uh, open space with with them and everything turns black and it ultimately destroys the kingdom or at least you know creates a very very dangerous situation where they have to exit so uh yeah that's what i wrote about that and i had a memory of it and i was like well i didn't know what they were and now it makes and when i started thinking about the black stone and you know maybe somehow um, integrating into what happened with with these uh, some of the sea mammals that that it affected them in a negative way. So it basically mutate. It's like, yeah, I mean, this is what black goo is doing here. Is it's mutating things into their more fearsome aspects. Mm -hmm. It seems, and. Uh, so you know, perhaps that was that start that thing started out just as a kind of innocent little skate, and turned out to be like was it two miles wide or something? You know, like huge. It was huge, and, and it, it just fly. covered everything. Yeah. And yeah, and then I also saw them. Uh, oh, uh, and this is in the sea or violets in the grass. I also saw them coming over to uh, what I believe was Tiamat, one of the early Earth. Was there uh, was a collision, and where the Lemurians were, which are also, I believe, some beings of the base, and uh, they had an encounter with the same beings, these skates. Uh, I call them a skate, but you know, stingray. And, uh, and oh, I don't really know, you know, what the outcome was, but uh, it, it seemed very uncomfortable. I don't think that they completely destroyed. But they did. You hey, know, it's uh, almost Jess, like um Jess, yeah? you're you're breaking up a little bit. Can I reset this call? Just a second. Sure. So you can see the communication that I have with uh JP was quite insightful. Uh he brings in another some interesting points. And during the, the, the transmissions, you could, there was a lot of technical issues, lots and lots of technical issues. And JP talked about how the dust and everything is, is if they don't want you to say something or do something, they can create all different types of anomalies to mess things up and mess with our technology so we don't get the information out. And so this, this is the whole point. I don't feel like I have... Um, I don't feel I have the knowledge of everything, and, and I think it's ridiculous if anyone claims that they do, but I would say that everyone has a piece of information that can help the whole collective uh, resolve things in the greater spectrum of, of our challenges today. 
And so in order to liberate ourselves from these problems, we need to really be open-minded and, and even look at what one would refer to as fictitious stories. But how is it that I have a memory of it, I've, uh, I have a memory of it originally, I get more information from Andronicus, and then here's the story coming up again with Jennifer many years later. It's because it's unresolved and because more than one, many, many people remember their perspective of the story. And if we put it all together, we might have solved some major problems that uh, would help humanity to rise. As they say, Atlantis rising with the sun, helping us to uh, go up into whether it's ascension or just that other um, next level of awakening. So um, I'm trying to see if there's any other points, last points. Oh, the black stones. The black stones um, originally in the Andronicus transmissions refer to these black stones that I noticed that were on the back of all of the Titans because they were part of this military group. And you can see those various groups that are formed as military, different factions form them. Someone by the name of Craton used these stones as a device and, and had them be uh, in, inserted in the back of the necks of these titans uh, as a form of communication and command. So he was over all of them and was instructing them. And I believe, um, according to the story, this, these are the black stones that end up in the bottom of the water in Neptune, which is, as uh, JP refers to, as potentially one of the uh, examples of black goo or, or as some type of uh, early tech that has invaded our thinking and, and corrupted what's going on, creating contrasts, confusion, mind control, and other issues. So here we go, you know, trying to sort through it all. But I will say, um, I just want to say uh, thank you all for listening and being open-minded and maybe with uh, added information that uh, we can all get through this. I will have a link uh, to my book as well. If those of you that are interested in reading it, you probably, you can purchase it online. And um, that's it. Have a good day. You have been listening to Androna Talks Radio. Join us on YouTube channel, Jessica Errol Morocco, and visit her website at www.readingsbyarial.com.